720, and Rosalind Morris attempts to unravel the continuing story of the Enfield Poltergeist. In October 1977, I went to a house in Enfield, in Middlesex, a very ordinary semi-detached house built by the local council in the 20s. A house, in fact, like thousands of others up and down the country, with three bedrooms upstairs and a living room, kitchen and bathroom on the ground floor. There, I heard, and tape-recorded, curious sounds, knocking sounds, which have become all too familiar to the family who live in that house. <laughs> First, 1977. Mrs. Peggy Hodgson, who's divorced from her husband, was spending a normal evening at home with her children, Margaret, Janet, Johnny and Billy. But around nine o'clock, just after the children had gone to bed, Mrs. Hodgson noticed some strange things happening. There was a noise in the back bedroom, uh, this shuffling, like the piece of furniture shuffling along uh, a floor, a linoed floor. And um, I spent about an hour or more trying to locate the noise and switching the light on and off but it seemed to start up when the light was off and stop when the light went on. I know it sounds a bit silly but I was trying to find out what it was. I was standing in the doorway while the children were in bed. Mrs Hodgson, now thoroughly alarmed, got the children up and turned to her next door neighbour, Vic Nottingham, for help. He works as a roofer and he thought perhaps it was something in the structure of the house that was causing the noises Mrs Hodgson could hear. All I could hear was this here knocking. And I didn't know what it was, no idea what it was. It was just a strange knock on the wall. I went up the stairs, and as I went up the stairs, this knock followed me. I got three knocks, three distinctive knocks on the wall. I carried on up the stairs, went into the bedroom, got into the front bedroom, three knocks on the wall again. Strange, I thought myself, I'm beginning to shake. So I goes in the back bedroom, same thing again, knocks followed me. Anyway, being in the building game, I thought to myself, well, I've got to have a look round the house. I've got to be brave, like, you know, and try and find out what it is. So I go through all the pipes, no airlocks or nothing like that. And it definitely wasn't a, a, a knock like that. It was a distinctive knock on the wall. So I go in, back downstairs again. I says to Mrs. Ogden, I said, I've just gone in my house a minute. I said, I'll go and get my son. And the granddad was there. So three of us have gone in the house now. We go up the stairs. And uh, I go into the front bedroom. My son goes in the back bedroom and Granddad goes in there. And we all get a distinctive knock. Not just one, but one in each room. So, of course, by this time, we're, I think we're all got a shake on now. We're, we're all frightened. So, um, anyway, we come downstairs and I said to Peg, I said, look, I said, Mrs. Ogden, there's something definitely strange in your house. I said, the best thing for us to do, I said, you'll come into my house. I said, we phoned the police. So anyway, we phoned the police up and they said uh, straight away, have you been drinking? So we said, no, definitely not. Like, has, has the people in the house been drinking? He said, no, no parties or nothing going on. So he said, well, we said, I can't come down tonight. I said, well, look, I said, there's a mother and four children. I said, no father here. I said, and there's something very funny in the house. I said, I'm afraid you've got to come down and see us. So within about 10 minutes, quarter of an hour, a police car arrives and there's a, a young policeman and uh, a woman constable. So he comes in all brave and let's have a look around his house and let's see what it is like, you know. So because he goes in the house and as he walks in the house, all he gets is this here knock, bang, bang. And the police woman at the back, she's getting a little bit shaky because I can see her, she's turning white. Anyway, um, he goes up the stairs and the knock follows him. The knockings weren't the only events to worry visitors to the Hodgson house that night. When, when we came down the stairs the first night, there was Mrs Hodgson and the four children, myself, my son and my wife's father, a policeman and the police constable. And it was, I think there was 11 of us. And as we were standing there, the children were sitting on the chair, there was a, an ordinary kitchen chair moved across the room, about, what, I suspect, 18 inches, something like that. It, it, it didn't move fast, but it didn't move slow. I, I, I wouldn't like to say how it moved. It was just as if it was um, pulled across the floor, just a short way. 
and that's when the um, the police woman got out of the house as quick as she could. But um, he looked over the house anyway, and he said, well, there's something definitely strange in the house. He said, but I don't know what it is. He said, I can't see nothing, so I can't take no one away. Off they went. <laughs> and that was the last time we ever see those two. We never did see them no more. That night, the Hodgson family slept next door, and in the morning, Vic Nottingham and his wife Peggy decided to try and find someone else to help their neighbours. The following day, I phoned the council. Oh, that's right, yeah. And they came down, and um, <coughs> they went in there, but because there was nothing happened while they was in there. And I think the following night, there was things going on again, so as soon as anything happened, the children were so scared, and because they just screaming and screaming so of course we had them in here again and anyway i phoned the police up again and uh, they did send someone else down but again the police couldn't help they could find no visible or physical cause for the events in the hodgson's house meanwhile mrs hodgson found that things were getting more and more disturbing i come out of Margaret's front bedroom because i saw them in the bed and as i turned around i saw uh, she had to draw a door dressing table, you can call it either, it was quite old. And it's sort of shuffling along near the doorway, coming towards the open door. I saw it move. And I beckoned to Margaret and she came out and she said, it's moving. And I looked, and we all looked at one another, and I went to push it back. I was so scared, but I actually tried to push it back to see whether it move again. And it moved again. And the third time I pushed it back and I was literally, well, I was really petrified because if you see a piece of furniture moving in the bedroom and nobody touching it, it can be really terrifying. Anyway, the third time I tried to push it back, I couldn't move it. It was coming towards me. So I said to the kids, well, you better get up and come downstairs if we can have this or not. We're not going to have any sleep anyway. So we wound up downstairs and we all slept on chairs all night. Bewildered and frightened, the family didn't know where to turn for help. During another disturbed night, Peggy Nottingham decided to try the Daily Mirror. She rang them at midnight on Sunday, September the 4th. A reporter and a photographer arrived at 2.30 in the morning. Graham Morris, the photographer, told me that they found the family all sitting round at the Nottinghams. They took a walk round the Hodgson's now empty house, but neither heard nor saw anything unusual. Soon after the Mirror Men returned to the Nottinghams, Vic and Peggy decided to take the children back to sleep in their own house. As soon as we entered the, the house, things just started happening. I mean, Lego bricks, marbles, bits and pieces, small bits and pieces, started flying around the house. One came, as I entered the front room, something, I think it was a Lego brick, came from behind me, very low down and very fast, and hit the wall in front of me. With that, I went straight to a wall, to a corner, I stood with my back to it so no one could throw anything from behind me and um, watch what was happening. Everybody came into the room. I think there were either 10 or 11 of us. The family we were with, the family next door, uh, the reporter from the Mirror and I. And we were standing in the, in the room and things just started flying around. The Lego came from one side of the room, came up into the corner, hit it very fast, very straight. Nobody moved their arm, nobody could have thrown or flicked or whatever uh, that, that piece of Lego. Or any of the others, there were four or five pieces thrown while I was there. One of them struck me on the head and had a lump on my forehead for well, three or four days afterwards. We were all slightly on edge, we weren't really sure what we were going to well, see, I think, was the, was the worrying thing. The Mirror Men returned the next day, September the 5th, and they brought with them a member of the Society for Psychical Research, a businessman and inventor called Morris Gross. I found chaos. The whole family was congregated in the house together with the neighbours next door and there were a lot of very, very frightened people there. Well, I got them into a little bit of order, so we sat down and we talked about what was happening and after they'd been talking for ten minutes or so, I began to realise that uh, here we had a classic poltergeist case on our hands. A poltergeist, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, is a ghost which makes its presence known through noises. It's actually a German word meaning noisy spirit. It's generally attributed to Martin Luther, who in the 16th century coined the word to refer to a noisy and, as he termed it, demonic presence. 
Poltergeist activity was first defined or distinguished from ghosts in the early 19th century, when English researchers into this obscure area began using the term to refer to cases in which knockings and unusual noises were heard, and where, in a majority of examples, crockery and other objects were thrown or moved about by some apparently invisible force. These cases often involved children around the age of puberty who were separated from one or both of their parents, either by death or by being forced to work away from home, for instance as servants. At the time when poltergeist-type activity began in Enfield, two of the Hodgson children, Janet and Margaret, were around puberty and, as I've said, living apart from their father. They were in a very, very frightened state. I don't think they were even thinking about explanations. A poltergeist had been mentioned, I believe, by one of the newspaper men. So uh, this obviously, this word was being bandied about. But they didn't even know what the, what the real word. In fact, the children were calling it a polka dice. <laughs> they didn't even know the name. But I told them that there was really nothing to be frightened about. Uh, I said it was probably the family themselves who were exerting this force. I didn't... Uh, I didn't theorise too much, but I had to give them some explanation to calm everybody down. Maurice Gross has been interested for many years in incidents which are often described by the term paranormal, but the events in Enfield were his first chance to study the possibility of such occurrences at first hand. Within a fortnight, he was joined by another member of the Society for Psychical Research, Guy Playfair. He's a writer on paranormal events, including poltergeists, and at first he was reluctant to go to Enfield, he was far more keen to take a much-needed holiday after finishing his latest book. I was um, fully intending to go up there, expose the whole thing as a fraud, tell Morris to uh, you know, do his homework and so on, and then go off on my holiday. That's what I wanted to do. But when I first went, I realised that everything Morris had told me was absolutely true. It was unmistakably a genuine case, and, and the reason I say that is that the family concerned would have had to have done a great deal of research to know what to do. See, if, if I want to fake a poltergeist, I can do a pretty good job because I've studied these things fairly carefully and I, I've been on five myself and I've read a lot of cases and I've talked to a lot of people who've been involved in them. But this, this particular family, they haven't got a single book in the house except the Bible and children's books and a few sort of uh, uh, pop uh, fan club magazines and so on. They're not uh, students of the paranormal. There are about 10 to 15 types of events which normally occur on poltergeist cases. All of them have occurred at Enfield. Poltergeist cases do follow recurrent patterns. Morris Gross and Guy Playfair have by now spent many thousands of hours with the Hodgson family, listening to the family's own accounts of what's been happening in their house and also tape recording events as they've occurred. I first visited the house on September the 10th, 1977, and it was on my second visit a month later in October that I was able to hear and to record the knocking sounds that you've already heard. That evening, the Hodgsons were trying to get to sleep in the front bedroom of the house, a room facing onto a main road. Although the house has three bedrooms, the family at that stage preferred to sleep all together in the same room. Johnny Hodgson was away from home at a special boarding school. So the family consisted of Mrs. Hodgson, Margaret, Janet and Billy. While they were attempting to settle down to go to sleep, Mrs. Hodgson's brother and his wife and son were with me on the landing of the house, while Guy Playfair was downstairs in the main living room. That's the room directly beneath the front bedroom. We began to hear knocking sounds at about 10.30 and they appeared to be coming from the floors and walls of the upper part of the house. This is what they sounded like when they started. After these sounds began, everyone in the house except the Hodgsons went into the downstairs living room and tried to work out where the knocks were coming from. 
Suddenly we heard a crash upstairs and I went up to the front bedroom with Guy Playfair to ask the family what had happened. Somebody hit me on the face. Oh no, it's Danny hit me on the face, Summit did. Yeah. She yeah. slapped me in the face and she's been slinging things. Yeah. All the bed's been shaking up and down. <laughs> it started off with violent knockings. It kept on and on and the bed seemed to be going like that. The vibration in the bed was shocking. The actual bed seemed to be shaking. Mm. This bed we're in. Then it slung this over here. Well, that's a what? That's a, a toy. That's a soft, sort of... Soft. Then it slung the box. It's a soft cat, a, a toy cat. Like a toy cat, yes. It's a thing what? Margaret made at school a long time ago. He hit me in the face. No, I was a bit scared when this bed started shaking. Well, it seems like it's underneath, trying to push it up. And it's I know, I'm not like going to say what I think. He's trying to push it upside down. In all, I heard about 30 rapping or knocking sounds spread over about 15 minutes. But by 11.30, when I left the house, everything seemed to be quiet. Mrs Hodgson, as you've just heard, was cautious, after two months of all this activity, about expressing theories. She claimed this was because the poltergeist seemed to act up on anything that was said. Inexplicable knocking sounds, the apparent projection of small objects and the movement of furniture by unseen forces were all witnessed by Graham Morris of the Daily Mirror. He spent eight months in the Hodgson's home trying to get pictures of these events. He rarely succeeded and he sometimes found that the activity, however it may be caused or constituted, had strange effects on his equipment. Uh, we had three flash guns set up in one room to photograph various bits and pieces and on setting them up, they were all fully charged that day, turning them on, they should have just stayed fully charged. They lost their charge. Over hours of use, obviously, they're being discharged, but to turn them on and for the a fully charged battery to be drained immediately is, as far as I'm concerned, impossible. Unusual things also happened to some video equipment which was briefly installed in the Hodgson's home in September 1977 by four engineers from Pi Business Communications Limited. They were invited into the house by Maurice Gross and they hoped that by using automatic cameras they might be able to film some of the happenings on video cassettes. One of the men from Pi concerned with this experiment was Ron Denny. The way you operate one of these cassettes is to simply slip the cassette in, it's run like a book, if you slide in. You press the lid down, you press the on switch, and it automatically threads up the cassette. And on this occasion, I went through this sequence, pressed the button, and all the lights on the recorder came on one after the other, which is absolutely impossible. Um, there's no way which we know that this can happen at all. Because it was a, the recorder had particular facilities on it for editing and sound dubbing and so on, each of which had separate buttons you had to press. And when you press these buttons, they lit up. And so there was no way, logically, that these buttons could, in fact, light up um, simply by pressing the on switch. But not only that, um, we found the machine wouldn't function. It jammed itself up completely. And when we eventually managed to re retrieve the cassette from the machine, we found that um, the tape had come out of the cassette and wound itself around one of the spigots underneath the actual cassette itself. Now, we've never had this happen before. And I've never had it happen since, and I would say it's, it's probably one chance in a million that that could actually happen. The four men from Pi, all working voluntarily and in their spare time, made three visits to Enfield and recorded 20 hours on video cassette, but caught nothing unusual. However, for Peggy Hodgson and her children, the unusual, the extraordinary, began to be almost ordinary and usual. Almost usual, but never predictable. I can remember one Sunday, I can't remember the day, but I can remember the day. One Sunday thing started falling down in there about half past ten and it kept on to about half past ten until there was nothing left to sit on. The chairs went over, the tables went over. You never know what's going to happen. When they get in, I mean, the door can open and shut and something can move, you know. There's one instance where I was doing some sausages. I've got so many in the frying pan and some under the grill because I can't eat fried stuff. And I'd got one too many in the pan, and Margaret and me were standing there and I'm counting them, and one jumped from the pan onto the grill. And these things, you they happen so quick, it's sort of like that. Nobody touches anything. It's almost as though someone's standing there with an invisible hand and lifting it from one place to the other. 
Mrs Hodgson's brother, John Burkham, is a hospital porter and he and his family live near to the Hodgson's in the same street. He claims he has not only witnessed strange events in his sister's house but in his own home as well. The strangest of these events took place in September 1977. On one Sunday, uh, Mrs Hodgson and the family were at my house and things started to happen in the afternoon. We were hearing footsteps upstairs, knocks and bangs. I went upstairs with Mrs Hodson and my daughter. We looked in her bedroom just in time to see the drawers in her dressing table opening and closing in literally in unison, coming backwards and forwards. Uh, we went into the, our, the front bedroom where the wife and I sleep. The curtains had been pulled. Up there I have a 22-inch television with that had been revolved around at an angle of about 45 degrees. By October, more than six weeks after the family first began hearing and seeing disturbing events in their house, Mrs Peggy Hodgson was worn out, both by nervous strain and by sleepless nights. She caught pneumonia and had to spend a week in hospital. Two of the children were briefly taken into council care, one stayed with relatives and one was away at school. Soon after this, Janet also became ill. On several occasions, spread over three weeks in November, she became hysterical and appeared to go into trances. She was seen by four doctors on four different occasions and all gave different diagnoses of her condition. New and even stranger developments took place in December 1977. In that month, deep, gruff voices began to be heard in the house. These appeared to come from Janet and Margaret, who were then 11 and 12. On January the 26th, 1978, I made a long tape recording of the voices of Janet and Margaret. What you're about to hear are extracts from that recording, and the hum that can be heard on this tape comes from a videotape machine which was also recording at the same time. Maurice Gross started the conversation on my behalf. Rosalind wants to know why you're here. Will you tell her? No. Or tell her one of the stories you told us. Go on, how old are you? Sixty-eight, it said. You're Sixty-eight. It's not from me this time. How long have you been here? Uh, How long have you been in this house? I don't know. You don't know. Why do you mean you don't know? I don't know. No, talk, talk to Rosalind. She wants to talk to you. Good evening. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Are there two of you there? Yeah. What are you called? Tom and Dean. And where's Harry? That's a joke, yeah. isn't it? What are the two of you called? <laughs> Margaret, are you all right? Yeah. Hello. Hello. Goodbye. Hello. Goodbye. Hello. Oh, God. He's coming. Does that happen often? Yeah, it's all swearing. Yeah, it's all swearing, yeah. Most of the time. The childish level of the conversation and the fact that when, for instance, I asked Margaret if she was all right, it was the gruff, mannish voice that replied yes, not her own, well, all that might lead one to suspect that these voices, if not the other happenings, were some sort of girlish prank. Well, are they? Professor John Hasted, the Professor of Experimental Physics at Birkbeck College in London, carried out scientific tests on both Janet and Margaret with an instrument called a laryngograph. This deep sort of speech is not unknown. Uh, it happens in uh, some uh, cases. I, I'm told that it's called La Tourette's Syndrome. And one can test by the laryngograph uh, whether the vocal folds are producing it or whether something else, possibly the muscles higher up the neck that control this and are called the false vocal cords. Well, certainly the laryngograph traces showed uh, that the false vocal folds were involved. I talked to the voices for a considerable time, more than an hour, so I wondered how easy it is to use the false vocal cords in this way. When you and I try to make a noise like that and try to do it, we get a sore throat. And this is because uh, the lubrication of those folds is inadequate. But I suppose it's possible to keep it up if the lubrication is rather better. 
and it certainly seems that this is what is happening. So is there any question of ventriloquism? Are the girls producing these voices deliberately? I suppose you mean, are they making them on purpose? Well, no one will ever know, because you can't prove what is conscious and what is unconscious. Mind you, I've studied the videotapes of the voice, I've studied the audio tapes, I've been there and heard and seen it going on, and I don't think they're producing it consciously. Uh, maybe they do sometimes, but usually not. But I can't prove that. Obviously, there's very little about this case that can be proved or tested scientifically. Maurice Gross and Guy Playfair have caught the children out, faking things. This is not to say that because you catch a child playing a trick once, therefore the whole case is a load of fraud. It is not. Maurice and I have sifted out of this colossal mass of material uh, 26 or possibly up to 30 incidents which we are completely satisfied and I mean completely, I don't mean I think they're genuine, I'm absolutely certain they have no possible physical explanation. Um, if the children involved decide to add a few tricks of their own, this is quite to be expected. It's a feature of the two best known poltergeist cases researched by William Roll, the Miami and Newark, New Jersey cases. This is quite normal, this is nothing unusual at all. Judging by reports from earlier centuries, voices in poltergeist cases are rare. Where they have occurred, they've often been attributed to the devil. Peggy Hodgson, Maurice Gross and Guy Playfair have all rejected the idea that the voices at Enfield could have diabolical origins. Guy Playfair is particularly hostile to this interpretation. Well, let me make it absolutely clear, I've got no time at all for this devil rubbish, which I, I say it is rubbish because it's, as far as I'm concerned, um, an invention of uh, medieval religious uh, dogmatists. It has no connection with reality. Nothing has ever been demonstrated or proved that there are such things. I can well understand how if some uh, fanatical uh, uh, exorcist went to the house in Enfield, he would no doubt feel that he had a whole legion of devils in the house. But I must make it very clear, we've had absolutely no indication at all of any diabolical activity, assuming there to be such a thing. I've no doubt we could have created it if we'd gone in with that sort of medieval attitude. I have read many other references to early cases, as early as the 17th century, where um, young girls began to talk in this gruff, uh, sort of rather hoarse voice. And I'm quite sure it was the same actual physical phenomenon that was taking place, but I hope that now we've learned to interpret it rather more realistically. The strange voices first appeared on December the 10th, 1977. A few days later, events of an even more extraordinary nature took place. Mrs. Hazel Short is a school crossing warden, a lollipop lady, and on December the 15th, 1977, she was on duty as usual on the crossing very close to the Hodgson's house. The house has a school opposite to it, and Mrs. Short had been on duty at the crossing at nine o'clock that morning. She returned at a quarter to twelve for her lunchtime duties, and she was walking towards the crossing when something about the Hodgson's house caught her eye. And on the roof, I could see a red cushion, and a fairly big one. And I saw the daughter of the house, Margaret, the oldest girl, standing outside, so I uh, asked her what the cushion was doing on the roof, being nosy. So she said that they hadn't got a clue how it got up there because the windows were closed. So, because we were standing there, talking, and kept looking up at it, all of a sudden I heard a bang. I see a book hit the front bedroom window, and that was followed by a pillow, striped, candy-striped pillow, then a book, then the pillow again. And I was standing there looking, and all of a sudden I saw the middle girl, Janet, going up and down in front of the window. Well, I thought that she was jumping up and down off the bed. But when I looked, she was horizontal, going up and down with her arms and legs going everywhere. And I, I suppose this about half a dozen times. And then it stopped. Then I had to cross over because the children started to come out of the, the school. But uh, it was frightening. I will say that. It did frighten me. I didn't think I would be because I... To be truthful, I thought it was all, uh, well, not phony, but, you know, if you don't know anything about anything, especially things like that, 
you're trying to uh, be a bit sceptical. And, uh, well, after that, I'm afraid I wasn't sceptical. It did frighten me. Put the wind up me, saying terrible, to be truthful. Levitation by Janet, or what appeared to warrant that description, was also witnessed on the same day by a local baker's roundsman, Mr John Rainbow. He was delivering bread from his van when he too saw the cushion on the roof and saw Janet at the window. Before that day, I would never have believed anything about it, although I'd heard, you know, various rumours about what had been going on in the house. The child appeared to float half around the room. At the same time, the curtains were were blowing in into the room as if there was a draught, although the windows were completely closed, so the, the, it wasn't a draught from outside that was blowing the curtains in into the room. It was obviously something from inside that appeared to be drawing drawing the curtains up off the window. And uh, the the articles and, and the child appeared to be revolving around the room in a clockwise direction. The child's arm banged against the, the window frame twice and I, I was frightened that, she, that she, the force that she banged against it, you know, that the window frame would, would have gone. I fully expected it to drop into the, into the road. I was frightened, there's no doubt about it. A key figure at Enfield on this particular day was David Robertson, an undergraduate who's studying the activities in the Hodgson home under the direction of Professor Hasted. Janet and Margaret had said, almost since the beginning of the extraordinary events at Enfield, that they sometimes found themselves being pulled, pushed or thrown about by an invisible force. Later, they claimed they'd sometimes floated for short periods, although no one else witnessed this. On December the 15th, David Robertson suggested to Janet that she should try to float or levitate under conditions where she could be observed. I took Janet up to the top bedroom where lots of phenomena appear to happen. This is the front bedroom of the house and then tried to talk to this deep voice that came from near Janet. I asked it whether it could lift Janet up into the air but I could only get a response when I was at either out of the room or facing the other direction so um, I started off by putting objects on the floor um, getting it to move them about throw them about the room and I could hear the objects moving but I was outside the room of course anyway I continued until it agreed to lift Janet up into the air and more or less just stood by outside making sure that she wasn't going to get hurt and um, uh, she described how she was floating about the room. Of course all this time there have been a group of people outside who have actually witnessed what was happening so it appears that she wasn't making it up or anything but uh, I never did get to see an actual levitation itself. At least the closest I got was um, crouching down, facing the door, and Janet was very near me, and she came over my head onto the floor. But it's impossible to rule out jumping there. But I did see that she didn't leave the room through the door. The beds were very hard and it's impossible to in, to bounce in a horizontal position so that you would um, be visible from the window. Janet claims that she not only levitated on December the 15th but that she passed through the bedroom wall into the Nottingham's house next door and then passed back again. This is her description of what happened to her on that day. Well I was sitting on the bed out there and I went on that bed and started levitating. I didn't feel as though I went through all, but I did, because I was in Peggy's house. I didn't know where I was, actually, because it was all white and there wasn't no door or windows. It certainly seems that the happenings in the Hodgson household reached their peak that December. It may be relevant that it was during this month that both Janet and Margaret reached menarche, that is, they started their periods. 
Since then, though activity has continued, it's not been so frequent or so violent. While many people believe in the existence of poltergeist phenomena, there is considerable disagreement about the nature or the causes of such phenomena. One of the world's leading authorities on the subject is Professor Hans Bender of Freiburg University. There are two sorts of poltergeist phenomena. One sort, one kind, bound to persons. That's the majority of cases. And another uh, category where the phenomena seem to be bound to a location. And in my material, 43 cases, I've only one case where the phenomena were bound to a location. Professor Bender believes that poltergeist activity almost always centers upon one particular person, the focus person, often a child around the age of puberty, or someone under some form of stress. Well, we think that it's a sort of um, discharge of uh, inner conflicts, and these conflicts are very often sexual ones, aggression against other people. You know, if a young person is in an aggressive state of mind, it may take a cup and throw it against the wall. Well, it's exactly the same motivation, only we can't explain how it works. The cup is thrown against the, wa the wall, but not by mechanical means, but by PK, by psychokinesis. Psychokinesis means um, a mind over matter in a physically not yet explicable way. Mm. But it's very often not only psychological uh, mental disturbances in the, in the focus person, but in the whole group, you know. So if you want to clear up the psychological background of a poltergeist case, you have to investigate, uh, to analyze the whole group, the family group. In the Enfield case, the closest observers came to believe that the focus person was most likely to be Janet. But when, in the summer of 1978, she spent three months away from home under psychiatric care, the activity in the house didn't go away. Will it ever stop? Maurice Gross. Frankly, we've tried everything in the book, everything that uh, is written down to say you should do so-and-so and so-and-so to stop the phenomena. The only thing we haven't done is uh, called in an exorcist. And the reason we haven't done this, as Guy explained before, is that we don't really think there's any de demon influence about. And on top of that, Mrs. Uh, Hodgson has been uh, antagonistic towards this solution. She has her own reasons for it, and we respect them. We've, we've said prayers. We've admonished it. We've threatened it. We've laughed at it. We've called in medical help. We've been to the social services. We've been to the welfare. We've sent the children on holiday. We've sent the mother on holiday. We've called in scientists, speech therapists, psychologists, mediums. We've had a lot of mediums in the house. You name it, we've done it. So how can we stop it? I think the, the thing will only go away when the time is right for it to go away but I couldn't make any predictions. Meanwhile, the Hodgsons go on trying to live ordinary lives in extraordinary circumstances. The children go to school, and Mrs Hodgson cooks the meals, shops, cleans and tidies, and makes the beds. We've had quiet nights. It's just the odd incident now. But you always get the feeling when you go up there that you're never alone. While I awake, I always go all around the room and I think to myself, where is it? You know what I mean? Where is it and who is it? The Enfield Poltergeist was presented by Rosalind Morris and produced by Sally Thompson.